Welcome to Voices and Leadership in Crisis. This is a very difficult time for this country. And uh, we ha have an event where major leaders discuss lessons learned and thinking about the future. I'm Bob Blendon. I'm a professor of health policy and political analysis, emeritus at the TH Chan, Harvard School of Public Health. And uh, our guest today uh, is uh, Sandra Fenwick, who is president of one of the best recognized hosp children's hospital in the world, uh, known all over in multiple languages. Uh, what we really want to do today with our guest is that we want to get some insights. Uh, somebody who leads a major institution has had to deal with this crisis and also about the future. The purpose of these efforts is for a broader audience to understand the choices we face as a country as we face leading institutions uh, uh, for this. Uh, and uh, normally, I would have a slightly different introduction question uh, for Sandra, but I can't help on today's national news, a very prominent person in the administration said uh, this COVID-19 virus is not much of a serious problem for children and they get over it right away. Uh, Sandy, I've got to ask you to respond to that before we get in the issues facing children's hospital. Well, thank you, Bob, and, and, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. You know, um, that has been sort of the uh, uh, statements that have been made for the last seven, eight, nine months, that children are so much less impacted and therefore children's hospitals are so much less impacted. But as the truth be known, even though children have had a lower infection rate, um, only about 600,000 of the children have been at least identified as being COVID positive out of the millions that have, have been impacted in this country. Um, uh, and the um, percentage of children uh, are only about 5% of the cases. Children have been impacted. Um, while they have a lower infection rate and many of the children have um, been gone through the process with much less illness than adults, they still have been impacted. Um, on average, the um, children are less ill. Um, when they're hospitalized, they've only been hospitalized at say the rate of five per 100,000 versus adults at 165 per 100,000, so a lower infection rate. But when children have been impacted and they are hospitalized, they uh, actually end up in the ICU at the same rate as adults, about a third of them all end up in the ICU. And so they have been impacted. And then there is also the new um, syndrome, the multi-inflammatory syndrome in children that was identified uh, approximately at the end of May, which has impacted children far more severely. And we are now just beginning to understand the complexity of that new syndrome where almost 800 children have been impacted, at least in this country. All right, uh, help us, for those of us who are very not very close to leading Children's Hospital, how has Children's changed the way you've had to lead, govern, organize services as a result of this outbreak? So people think that the Children's Hospitals have been less impacted because the children have had a lower incidence of disease. Um, and the truth be told, we have had to respond very similarly to all the other hospitals, particularly in this marketplace that has been pretty hardly hit. Um, we had as first and foremost, like everyone else, put safety in front of everything. So it became our North Star. And we had to find ways to protect not only our patients and families, but also our staff and our faculty. We remoted uh, as many people as we could. Over 9,000 of our people um, had to be remoted and our, many of them are still uh, working from a distance. Uh, we had to cancel or defer many of the non-urgent care, both uh, surgical procedures, uh, inpatient uh, and ambulatory visits. So we went actually from about uh, seeing 
25 patients per day virtually to almost 2,000 per day in about two weeks oh. so that we could continue to care for the patients. So very much like the adults, we had to clearly uh, respond and uh, uh, train all of our people, whether it's from the emergency room where they would first see a patient and family to the ORs and the ICUs where we were continuing to care for uh, children with rare and complex and congenital disease that still needed to be cared for. So um, while we were very much like adults, we also had some unique issues and be happy to talk about that as well. Let's uh, do that because around the world, people are gonna be interested in a, a discussion that they never would have heard before. What are the unique issues and how did you respond to them? Well, there was still a lot of, of um, confusion as to how children were really being affected by as we talked about earlier, yeah. uh, were we going to see the same kind of surge that we saw with adults? And so one of our physicians, Dr. Jeff Burns, initiated a worldwide call. Um, and it was called the Pediatric International Collaboration on COVID and MISC. And gathered together uh, pediatric intensivists and then ultimately specialists across the world. Yeah. The CDC joined in the WHO, the, the European Commission, yeah. to share best practices, to share learnings about children, to track uh, the disease in children, yeah. and ultimately to understand this new syndrome. So um, we led that process, and frankly, it's still going on every single week uh, Good. today. <laughs> yeah. And what we um, obviously also had to deal with is, should we have to ha uh, take care of adults when the surge uh, really was hitting us as a community. And while we take care of adults with congenital disease, we do not take care of adults with adult acquired disease. And so rather than gear up to take care of adults, we decided the best way that we could contribute was to become a pediatric coordinating center yeah. where we would be able to support the adult hospitals that might have to divert their pediatric care uh, elsewhere and repurpose their pediatric ICUs and their units to adult care. And so we became a sort of a center across wow. the state, New England, to care for those children who needed either COVID care or routine um, emergency or otherwise care uh, as a pediatric hospital. We also could not turn away parents and caregivers. Yes, uh, I was just gonna ask you Yes. <laughs> and families are essential uh, yeah. to children when they are sick. They yes. are part of a care team. Uh, they support the child, but they support yeah. the care team as well. Yeah. And so we had to figure out how to not only care for the children, um, but also care for the parents, the caregivers as well. How did you make That's that work? Unique. That's not easy. Yeah. Some unique things that really were true for children's hospitals. Um, what were some of the unexpected, not with this whole outbreak, it wouldn't be, unexpected issues you had to face beyond the ones we discussed? Um, you obviously got children from other hospitals, you had to deal with the families. Uh, was the equipment available, protective devices, what you would have hoped or expected, or were there things that were really missing to make this work? Well, no one really expected the volume um, that we were all experiencing, both uh, ensuring that our staff and our patients and families were safe. So PPE, protective equipment, yeah. became really the way we could continue to function. Um, we needed uh, masks and gowns and gloves and plexiglass and it, you know, our ability to separate out everything from our waiting rooms to how we had uh, yeah. unique and uh, very carefully planned COVID operating rooms, COVID uh, ICU rooms and the like. Luckily, um, we were designated as a special pathogen treatment center for children huh. back in 2015. And so we uh, were, were training literally every single year for the past five years. Our staff in turning, uh, knowing how to uh, don and doff equipment safely uh. to protect themselves and everyone else. 
um, and they went out across the entire institution to train everyone to give them the comfort in their own protection and also the protection and safety and to reduce the fear and concern of anyone right. who came here for care. Um, testing became another issue. Um, not only standing up our own testing so that we would not be dependent on standing in line for many, many days of not knowing whether <laughs> someone- That's what I it. wondered about, what you were going to do both with staff and patients with these backlogs for uh, tests. And if you didn't get the results, you, you were using a lot of uh, protective equipment, yeah. uh, not knowing whether someone was positive or negative. So there were a lot of things that really compounded the challenge. And uh, our teams from our supply chain to our pharmacy, to our laboratory people, to our command center that had been set up since January and still is set up and running, uh, really ran this hospital. So in your career, have you had an emergency like this before? Or have there been others that sort of give you perspective of what had to be done? Well, we've had our, you know, our challenges. We've had the, bo the bombings, the marathon bombings. Yeah. We've had uh, other challenges with uh, uh, other outbreaks that we had to be H1N1. And uh, we were a pathogen treatment center for Ebola. Yeah. Thank goodness we... Yes. Really we're not impacted by that, yeah. but there have been other both pathogenic outbreaks as well as, uh, you know, hurricanes and blizzards. And so each one of those we respond. Uh, this one clearly um, was the most extended and the most severe. Uh, so I almost feel invisible calls. Bob, will you ask her about the future? <laughs> for children, what are we likely to see? Vaccines, treatments, uh, do you see the caseload going down? Are you gonna shift how kids are managed? Uh, and can you reassure 10 million parents in about two minutes? <laughs> sure. <laughs> wow, there's a lot, of, a lot of territory to cover there. Yeah. So, you know, today we are still clearly recovering. Um, as, as I think you, and many people have seen, there's some serious concern that uh, there has been a diminution in care for children, uh, as we are concerned. That vaccinations are down, that well screening of children, both for uh, developmental issues as well as mental and behavioral yeah. health issues, uh, have all been de uh, decreased. Uh, managing chronic conditions of children with asthma and diabetes, uh, we are all concerned about that. So we need to catch up. We need to be concerned about the social needs of these children um, that have been impacted by food insecurity and housing and the safety issues that are in many of our towns and cities. Um, there is a fear of coming in, so we have to work to ensure people that this is a safe place, that our community health centers, our primary care centers, our hospitals are yeah. safe places, and that they need to return for routine care and for emergency and urgent care. So that's in the immediate future, uh, Bob. But then there are the issues that I think we all need to think about, and that is, what are the issues that are gonna be facing children long-term? And right. there are many of those as well. Um, in terms of a, a vaccine for COVID, do you see it coming, and is it likely to be helpful for kids? So um, obviously there are a number of, uh, uh, companies and institutions that are working at uh, warp speed. Yeah, uh, to, <laughs> I didn't use that. <laughs> <laughs> so they're working at least very diligently and with uh, an enormous amount of effort and, and, and purpose to try and bring a vaccine safely to the population. Um, as we all know, children are usually not the early part of the, yeah. uh, of the clinical trials. Uh, there's one company that is working on uh, trying to at least initiate some to the age of 16, but that means that children between zero and 16 will probably lag uh, in terms of when they will be uh, uh, ready for, for vaccinations. So we have to think very carefully about how to continue to protect children, um, children as potential transmitters to the other more vulnerable right. population. Uh, but there's a lot of work going on, including work here at Boston Children's Hospital. Yeah, so why don't we talk about some of the scientific 
promises. It's a, 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 a dream, millions, myself included. We can find something in the future through science that's actually going to alter this. So um, let's just talk about vaccines for a moment. Yeah. We have a, a precision vaccine program led by Dr. Ofer Levy, um, who has been working on a number of different, he was a, a very early identified by the NIH to continue his work. And a lot of what he has been working on is, is uh, in the area of adding adjuvants to vaccines to try and boost the immune system to yeah. be more responsive to the vaccine protection. And he's working very closely on not only uh, the work that might be available, not only for children who are immunocompromised, but actually the elderly because of their severe compromised immune systems. Yeah. So there's wonderful, exciting work going on there. Um, Dr. Rick Malley, who runs our other part of our vaccine program here at the hospital, has been very instrumental in advising about uh, who should get vaccinated. How do we think about the whole population? And uh, how do we ensure that we go after the most likely to protect yes, the broadest right. population? So we have wonderful work there. Dr. Adrian Randolph has also gotten one of the largest CDC grants called Overcoming COVID-19. And she and colleagues now in 70 centers across the country are collecting a registry of data across uh, all of the country, looking at why children are, um, are being affected in a different stratus. Um, you know, so how do they stratify risk? How do they understand who's vulnerable for the MISC syndrome? Um, why are some children so severely impacted? How much of that is underlying yes. disease? How much of that is genetic predisposition? And so within that, she's got colleagues now, uh, Dr. Uh, Jane Newberger is working on an NIH pediatric uh, heart uh, network, looking at the long-term effects of MISC on the cardiovascular system in children so that we truly can understand not just the immediate impact, how to treat, how to set up protocols and guidelines for today, but how do we think about the long-term impact of this on children going forward? And that's what a lot of parents are worried about, this issue of kids in schools. It's not only if they get infected, what is the long-term impact? for exactly. my child if this happens. Exactly, and, and in immunology, for instance, Mary Jane Son and Janet Chow are uh, working on what are some of the genetic and immunologic predispositions? What is this innate immune system that we're hearing about that are uh, protecting children from some of the ravages of this disease? And how does that differ as they age? And the 10-year-olds and the yeah. teenagers now become more vulnerable. And as we move into adulthood, what is this adaptive uh, immune response that is really lagging and making us all more vulnerable? So, you know, at Children's, we're working on many things that relate to children, but also have enormous implications for the adult world as well. So how about the short-term revolution? Like it or not, we went to telehealth and telemedicine in a way I don't think anybody predicted in a speed. What's your take about managing some of the issues, including the mental health issues and others, for children that grew out of this? And your view of the future, are we, is this something you do temporarily because you can't be seen, or do you see this evolving uh, as uh, children being at least partially cared for in a different approach? Great question, Bob. You know, I, we were getting ready to really launch a, a much uh, deeper and uh, broader uh, uh, use of telemedicine and eventually remote monitoring and even home care for, for care of the home and, and the like. And this clearly has accelerated and catapulted us into yeah. a whole different level of, of activity. Um, we were doing 85% of our ambulatory work at the height of the pandemic uh, when we were in a top, the top of the surge. That has settled down to now 50% of yeah. our ambulatory activity. But in areas like mental and behavioral health, it's still almost 85 to 90% of what we're doing because it has proved incredibly effective and has opened up access and has opened up even more uh, capability 
to treat more children um, by having uh, them not have to travel, uh, reduce the fear of coming in and the like. <clears throat> and so I think this is absolutely here to stay. We don't know if it'll land at the 50%. Uh, it may drop to 30% of our activity. And we're now trying to also study in our patient safety and quality department, um, how has this been effective, safe? Uh, where has it been actually better care in yeah. some instances? And where has it been really needed to be replaced by in-person care? So I think there's a lot to be learned still. Uh, so some of my health and medical professional friends want to know you had to engage in a lot of training with some of your staff to be able to do this effectively, I assume. <laughs> Absolutely. So many of them, you know, in the very early stages um, were trying to figure out how to use the technology. Uh, we had luckily already planned. Let me just uh, raise my hand. Yeah, well, me too. <laughs> For sure. And still, uh, I almost didn't get on the webinar. Yes. <laughs> uh, but um, but uh, seriously, we had started almost two years in advance with a whole program in our digital innovation program, trying to prepare both our platform and how we would actually start training people. And we had a whole series of people ready and able to specifically train our That's, clinicians is, yes. almost instantaneously. Uh, and so they were there to answer questions, to yeah. help with technology. And um, at the beginning stages, it was, um, it was less uh, satisfactory to patients and, and clinicians. But very rapidly, we were hitting out of 8, 9, and 10 on a scale of 10 satisfaction yeah. from both, which means that, you know, I think people adapted pretty quickly, both on the receiving and on the giving end. Uh, so I, I have to switch to my own area. Uh, I have been terribly impressed that the Congress grasps some of the issues that face the major institutions. Uh, if they had a focus, including recognizes the risk to children, what should we be doing in getting help from Washington for major children's hospitals? Oh, I love this question. You know, I chair the Children's Hospital Association yes. and Public Policy Committee. And we've been working literally for years in first and foremost trying to ensure that there is the right amount of investment in children. And I can go into that whole aspect of investing in children maybe toward the end. But children's hospitals play a really unique role. Uh, there are uh, really only 200 of us really that are uh, only 30 of us that are freestanding, yeah. that are truly dedicated to children. And then there's another 150, 160 uh, that are hospitals within hospitals that play a very important role for children. Um, understanding the special needs of children, understanding that their cost structure is different, understanding that more than 50% of the children and the revenues that are in the children's hospitals come from the Medicaid program, not the Medicaid. That's something program. I don't believe there's much public understanding of. 50% of the yeah. children in this country are yeah. covered by Medicaid, yeah. which is an enormous number that most people don't understand. And how vulnerable they are if the access is cut or the payments are reduced substantially so that you know, there is reduced access and right. coverage for children. And so how we ensure that, um, that coverage and, and appropriate payment for services through the Medicaid and the CHIP program are, are continued, Bob. Uh, I don't think we can possibly um, support that, that issue and, and that notion enough. So something I just would tie together, many states in the next couple of years are gonna have huge deficits because of this. And in talking about just limiting spending, I don't think many people realize how many children are dependent on the state support for Medicaid. Uh, is, and yeah. if you're not careful, uh, what happens in these the, the abstract discussions about deficits, thousands of children really can be affected. Um, you are so right. And, and, and Bob, these are the children that are in communities um, that have 
all the other social determinants of health issues. Yeah. So food insecurity and housing insecurity and potential loss of jobs and uh, safety and violence in their community and racial and ethnic yeah. and uh, inequalities and inequities. And so we really need to think about uh, the impact that that would have on not only those children, but many of the children in Medicaid right. are those with the uh, most complex disease. Right. And so it's not just uh, children in poverty, it's children who have extraordinary challenges as children with yeah. complex disease. Right. Have you been able to take children into some of the other issues you've talked about, uh, the problems these families face beyond the immediate need for health care? Is Absolutely. that something? Yeah. We have a, um, you know, ever since I, I think this hospital can remember when it wrote its mission statement, uh, it has a four part mission of care and research and education and community. And community has been in a very important mission for this hospital. And we have a very strong Office of Community Health led by an extraordinary physician with a huge team that um, spends an enormous amount of time working not just with the community health centers, but with also many of the agencies that support children, not only their health, but their mental and behavioral health, as well as working with uh, schools um, in not only Boston, but across the state, uh, across New England and uh, beyond. Child care centers, because zero to five uh, development and care is as important as, as education beyond that. And so we have been working on all of those issues. And co with COVID, we have really reallocated a fair amount of, of resources to ensure that our patients and families are getting those essentials, food yeah. and housing security and all of those other issues. So not only before uh, COVID, during COVID, but clearly after when we think about the issues of, you know, obesity and asthma and uh, learning and development and all of those issues that plague children uh, in the inner city and, and in the community are ones that we've worked very closely on. So uh, it's by requirement you ask, whenever you have a crisis, you ask someone in a very leadership role, if you were thinking again, were there some things you might have done differently that if somebody about to take on your role in the future, let me just give you three pieces of advice. What would you give them? Oh, um, you know, it's interesting. Today, I got a note from a wonderful staff member who talked about leadership. And, uh, you know, I think the most important thing is surrounding yourself with the real experts, um, those who are truly knowledgeable. They may be your top team, and they may be people within you, deep in your organization. You know, I, I talk about our supply chain people. Um, they kept our hospital running. Yes, I can. Yes. Our pharmacists kept our hospital running. Our laboratory technicians kept our hospital running. But also our doctors and our nurses and our command center. Um, those people, our infection control team, our infectious disease people, were truly the ones who were providing the, the guidance, our, our safety people, so that we really truly could protect ourselves and obviously those we served. So, so surrounding yourself with experts, listening to them, taking their expert advice. And then as someone said, sometimes when you're hearing all the right and all the important information, taking some leaps of faith. And, <laughs> Which is true with an outbreak. I mean, right? right. And not uh, having all of the answers before yeah. you have to also move forward and make decisions. Uh, did you find uh, it useful to have conversations with people heading other children's hospitals about how they were dealing with that, or it turns to be very institution specific? We uh, held a, a children's hospital. Uh, I'm on the board of the Children's Hospital Association. We held a huddle uh, every week uh, to learn from each other, and it was extremely helpful and important. One of the things I learned from my colleagues was how important it was that they employed something called taking a safety pledge. And it was really asking everyone, 
to say, I am here to protect not just myself, but to protect those around me and to ensure that, you know, everyone, and we see this in our community. Um, I wish our whole community would take the safety pledge um, because right now without a vaccine, that's the only way we can control this. And so we've learned so many things from each other. Um, clinicians have had huddles, not just within the hospital. We've had our own huddles daily here at the hospital through the command center and our leadership team, but also across the city. Um, we as CEOs had an early huddle uh, every couple days and, and weeks, and uh, we had wonderful collaboration across the city with our leadership. Um, the mayor called uh, an advisory group together. So the collaboration uh, in many, many, many different ways was absolutely essential in learning from each other and actually employing great ideas from, from each other. So I'm going to uh, switch for a few minutes and we're going to bring our students in to ask some questions. Uh, for the audience, we have a secret agenda. We want them to grow up to be Sandra. Uh, so one of the first steps is starting having them interact with you, listening to this and have some questions. Let's move in order for the questions the way we decided. Hi, Sandy. Um, thank you so much for being here and sharing your experiences with us. Um, my name is Barbara Way, and I am a first year student studying health management, uh, and I'm from Chicago, Illinois. And during your talk, you spoke about how COVID-19 affected children and also touched on the racial and social inequalities that the pandemic has unveiled. So I want to learn more about how does Boston Children balance its focus on providing the highest level of care and also improving access in the underserved communities? So we have, thank you, Barbara, and welcome. Uh, um, we have always been need blind in, in caring for children. And that means from every dimension. Um, and, and so that's a philosophy we've always had here at Children's. And, um, However, increasingly, we are understanding that there is still a lot of work to be done to understand where there are gaps um, in access, gaps in the way we even think about uh, caring for, treating, educating. And so we are now going to be doing an even deeper dive to segment the population so that we can understand if there are differences, what they are, and how do we specifically address them? Rather than assuming that we are treating everyone exactly the same and should be treated the same, are there differences and do we need to adapt to how people culturally, from a language perspective, from an environment perspective, from a um, ethnic and cultural perspective, either hear things differently or, or receive information and uh, are treated differently. So um, we, wanted, we wanna make sure that we are doing that and being sensitive to the differences. Thank you. Allison. Hi, Sandy. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Alice Lee and I'm also an MPH student in the Health Management Field of Study here at Harvard. I'm originally from Los Angeles. Um, you've already touched on this topic a little bit, but I'd love for you to elaborate more on this. Um, so early on in the pandemic, hospitals and other care facilities recognized the need for decisive actions to protect their patients. Um, they responded by restricting visitors to facilities, which ended up socially isolating patients against their will. So as a leader, how do you balance the need for swift decision making with ethical considerations for um, patients' rights? And how do you do this on limited information? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we are in a unique situation here at Children's because as I said, families and caregivers are an essential part of both the care and the healing process for children. So while the adults were able with, with a lot of difficulty and with excruciatingly challenging thought that went into that decision, um, we knew we couldn't. And so, uh, and that was true of children's hospitals across the country that we knew that we had to allow for at least one caregiver slash parent guardian uh, or two, because for the most part, we have to accommodate the children and, and, and their families all the time. Parents rarely wanna leave their children 
for any amount of time when their children are hospitalized. It's the most difficult time of their lives, uh, both from the children's perspective as well as from the, the caregiver family's perspective. Um, and so we knew from day one that that would be something we had to do. So we had to figure out how to do that and how to do it safely. So for us, it was um, really not a choice um, because the burden that it would have potentially put on even our own staff without the families who know their children so well, who really truly have more information that helps the care, that helps um, the child, uh, that calms the child, um, is, is something that uh, was, was just an essential part of how we had to just adapt and, and, uh, and accommodate for that. Thank you. Josh. Hi, thank you so much for this really fascinating and engaging discussion. My name is Josh Moroff, just like Barbara and Alice, I'm a master of public health student in health management here at Harvard Chan. I'm also a medical student going into pediatrics. So this has been a especially very interesting conversation for me. Uh, and I'm just from outside of Detroit, but I'm zooming in from here in Cambridge. My question for you is with this being such an unprecedented event, I'm wondering what you were able to draw on from your past experiences or prior education to help guide your decision making. In a sense, how did you decide what was right for Boston Children's during a time when the right answer may not have been so clear? Well, I, I a little bit answered that question too, Josh. Um, you know, for me, it is being surrounded uh, first and foremost by an extraordinary team. And, you know, for me, people are um, the greatest asset that this hospital has ever had. Uh, both historically and today. And that's true of the immediate leadership um, on the clinical, on the research, on the executive side, and you know, surrounding yourself with people who truly are expert, who have a um, commitment and a, uh, a, a, an important uh, uh, emphasis on, what, on doing always what's right to do, not always the easy thing to do. Um, is really what I have always been trying to surround myself with. And then listening to them and ensuring that their voice and their concerns are expressed so that we have the most thoughtful amount of information before we make decisions. Um, and then also letting uh, people go. And when you say, you know, we're going to go do this and people feel empowered to go and implement what we've said, get out of their way. <laughs> and support them and ensure that they have the resources, the tools, that we're there to remove the barriers and to give them the, um, the opportunity to do uh, what we've all agreed is the right thing to do. So, you know, it's a little bit of what I talked about before, but I keep coming back to that because that has um, been my philosophy in, uh, in how to, to lead and that clearly I am not an expert. I don't have all the answers, but I certainly want to uh, rely on those who can best inform our most challenging and difficult situations. Uh, uh, Sandy, let me close with, with one, and it obviously relates a bit to my own interest and background. Uh, when the election is over and everything else, and even uh, finally COVID winds down, there's going to be a need to really look ahead and say, there has to be some lessons for how we prepare for another one of these. From a children's hospital perspective, if you were saying to a new president or something, there's something you really have to pay attention to next time around, we can't do it this way, what would you say to them? Well, I think one of the things we could have done better is to have a greater national surveillance system a greater ability to stand up testing faster and an ability to think about how to do, uh, you know, sort of routine tracing and contact tracing. I mean, the, all of those things may have given us more tools to get ahead of this. Um, you know, the, the research that is continuously needed to understand pathogens and to be prepared for the next one, which yes. may or may not be known to the human body. Right. Uh, we need to be able to respond with continued support and research at the NIH level, uh, supporting the CDC so that we have both the research that's going on that can be pivoted uh, to whatever the new pathogen is, but also the CDC that's there 
as a surveillance uh, organization with real support, um, both from a technological perspective. So Dr. John Brownstein, for instance, uh, 11 years ago, set up a very interesting system here called Help Map. And it's a crowdsourcing system that uh, really was used to track flu, to track other pathogen outbreaks uh, around the world, and uh, has been used by the CDC and the WHO uh, as a source of identifying where things might be, um, uh, what, where there might be clusters. Now, clearly, even during COVID, um, there may be cluster outbreaks, and we need to figure out how to zero in, whether they're in schools, whether they're in other hospitals, how do we try and get our arms around those very quickly and contain them? And um, so I think we need support on those kinds of tracking analysis and visualization systems that Dr. Brownstein and his whole teams have been trying to stand up and frankly either have um, either philanthropic resources or, or, uh, or institutional resources to support. That should be really something that our government supports much more, uh, much more broadly. Uh, so Sandy, thank you very much. But really in, in the last part, uh, this is an effort to give a much broader public an understanding about what leaders can actually do in a crisis and try to get the broader issues. And the problem with the news is it's very narrow in what is covered. And our hope is to have uh, basically people who uh, did an extraordinary job have an influence of where the future goes here. So I thank you very much and the students for joining us, but it's incredibly important that a larger audience understand the choices that you had to make uh, because we have had a real problem of getting enough public support to do the things that you're talking about because there's not a lack of awareness. So again, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you and I are not meeting in another crisis like this again. But I it's agree, been Bob. enormously helpful Thank for you. our audience and our students. Thank you again. Bob, may I make a final plea oh, for everyone yeah. in the audience that children may only represent 25% of our population, but they are 100% of our future. Absolutely. Their, health, their Let mental us, and behavioral yes. health, yeah. the social determinants, yeah. their development before yeah. school, schools, and you know the 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 real uh, jeopardy that children yes. um, are in. We need to think about how we invest and make that both a national and a worldwide priority. So, thank you for the opportunity to make that and last. Thank point. you for incredible insight into where we can go in this country. Thank you. And thanks to students.